All right. Sound now. I'm hoping that there's sound. Hopefully I'll get a text from one of my fellow colleagues that are monitoring. Still no sound. All right. I think I'm going to take out the microphone. A little bit of technical difficulty, folks. How about now? If there's sound, go ahead and text me, Mr. Holiday. All right. I'm Stephen Brugerhoff. I'm your host for this afternoon. Excellent. Thank you, sir. We've got a team of horticulturists that are helping to answer questions for you. My name is Stephen Brugerhoff. I'm horticulturist with Brazoria County AgriLife Extension here in Angleton, Texas. I'm part of the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension team of horticulturists throughout the state. We're providing this program to you, Aggie, Aggie Aggie Horticulture Facebook Live. We've been doing this for months, but we're providing quality programs to you covering ornamental horticulture, turf or lawn culture, herbs, fruit trees, vegetable gardening, you name it. We're providing sound and quality information to you, research-based information to help improve the skills that you currently have. Or maybe you're a beginner. You might learn something from the programs that we do have for you. I want to give a shout out to my team of horticulturists that are helping to answer these questions that you might have. If you do have questions, go ahead and post them in the chat function of the Facebook viewing page that you're on. They'll help to answer some of those questions. I'm flying solo out here at our demonstration garden, so if you do, if there are any questions that I can answer later, I'll make sure to get back and do that. So we're broadcasting from the Brazoria Environmental Education Station. That's our demonstration garden down here in Angleton. Angleton is the county seat of Brazoria County. It's right in between Houston and Lake Jackson, if you're familiar with those cities. I'm very happy and proud to serve our community, and I've been doing so for the past three years and growing. So thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. The program will take about 40 minutes today. If you do hear an alarm, that's my alarm telling me because I'm running solo to go ahead and stop. But uh, we hope you, that you'll enjoy this program on fabulous figs. So figs are an ancient, ancient plant. They've been around uh, through millennia for civilizations. They've certainly been celebrated uh, in culture as well in uh, culturally through daily life through religious practices as well. They've been celebrated throughout the millennium. They're thought to have originated in Asia Minor or Western Asia. You'll have to look at a globe and kind of cast your mind to where that might be. But certainly it's, it's such a favored and treasured fruit that it's spread across the globe. For the United States, for this territory that was not the United States at that time, the, Sp the Spanish brought figs to California, Southern California in the 1700s. Currently, contemporarily, in the United States, 98% of fig production comes from California. A little bit of history about figs. I, I have to be proud and give a shout out to our area of the Gulf Coast, the upper Gulf Coast Bend. In Angleton and the surrounding area, we're actually the cradle of Texas. The, our chapter Master Naturalist program calls themselves the, the Cradle of Texas Master Naturalist chapter. So we have to celebrate this area because if you think about it, this is where some of the first colonies started in Texas, which I think is fabulous. But in, around the 1900s, there was high production of figs in Galveston and Brazoria County. Galveston County stretches all the way up to the border of Houston, out to the island, covers Friendswood, parts of Pearland, keeps going, what is that, east? There was a lot of fig production at that time. Uh, I, I viewed some information from the uh, Texas Historical Commission saying that high fig production happened here in these counties and in Texas. So we win from the uh, early 1900s to about 1930. It was estimated right around the late 40s, there was approximately a thousand tons right? That's a th 1,000 tons that were produced annually up until that time. Now there used to be canneries and, and little smaller production uh, orchards as well as larger production orchards in and around small towns here. Some of these towns may sound familiar outside of Houston. 
Of course, Pearland, there was a cannery up around that area up into the 90s, I believe, 1990s. Uh, not a cannery, but a, a storefront and a production. But there were canneries out in Alvin around, um, what is it? It's San Leon. San Leon is a small community right outside of Galveston. I have a picture and some publications from the US, uh, USDA that has images that, that is documenting fig production here in Texas, which I think is wonderful. You gotta know where you came from to know where you're going, right? So we, we, our county was, I'm very proud that our county was really high in production of, of figs. Unfortunately, over time with the advent of storms, freezing events, the depression, economic reasons, uh, figs went into decline as far as commercial production in Texas. So again, high production now in California, but um, it's limited here in Texas. And there's several reasons for that. If you've grown figs before, or maybe you're new to figs, you know that these are perishable fruits. We treasure them because we, you know, we wait until they, they uh, start to mature on the tree and then once they're that golden brown or that nice amber color on the outside of the fruit or sometimes even black or purple, when they reach that full maturity, they're gone within a couple of weeks. They start to decline pretty quickly. So I'll, I'll introduce, I'll take us out to the orchard in a bit. I'll walk us to the orchard. Right now I'm under the canopy of this tree to kind of reduce the heat, <laughs> right? I don't want this, this uh, program to, to die in the middle of the program. So we're doing this under canopy for now. But anyway, these, these uh, fruits are highly perishable. That means that once you get them off the tree, you need to ship them out as quickly as possible. A lot of us probably experience, our fig, uh, fig experience probably comes from these kind of items, right? You know, you probably grew up thinking, these are the only kind of figs I have. Well, they do have a, a taste to them. They have this wonderful kind of earthy taste, I think, you know, in, in these fig bars. I'm not going to show you a brand name. I'm just going to point them out, fig bars. And so they have a particular taste, and that's what I knew growing up. We didn't have a fig tree in my backyard. It wasn't until I got older and got out on my own and started exploring horticulture as a profession, which you can have a profession in horticulture, living proof, that we started to uh, understand and grow some of these plants and then eat them fresh off of the tree. So they're delicious fresh off of the tree. And each one has a distinctive flavor to it. The only other way we know how to get, we know to get figs is through products, right? Through dried figs. Let me pull one out of this bag. I opened the, uh, the bag a few moments ago. The dried figs do retain their shape somewhat. These are a variety called Mission Fig. It was the favored Mission and Magnolia were the favored figs, favored flavor, the favored figs at the t at the, in the early 1900s as far as production here. So they're dried, they retain their st shape somewhat. When you open this bag of dried figs, it's a little robust. You know, it, you can definitely tell there's a fruit in there. But, um, so I'm, I'm keeping it closed because the, the flies know that it's there as well, and the ants as well. So you may have been introduced to figs through a dried product or through a, a fig bar. Now I got lucky that there was um, fig, fresh figs at the local supermarket. I'm not gonna name, tell you which one down in Lake Jackson, but they actually did import some fresh figs. So these came from, this particular product came from Mexico, shorter distance in California somewhat, um, depending on where it's at. And they're shipped uh, containerized in, in, um, in refrigerated cars to keep them as fresh as possible. So maybe you're lucky and you, you've got these from a farm stand or um, a grocery store and you, you know, you've actually gotten them a little bit dark, maybe not as vibrant looking as they can be fresh off of the tree. But still, fresh figs are better, I think, better than dried figs or certainly better than the bars themselves. What we're looking at, of course, is trying to get a fig off of a tree that has this unique color specific to the variety. And I'll talk about varieties in a little bit. I'll introduce you to some varieties that you can use. So figs are, are treasured, I think, because they have a, such a short shelf life. You maybe have about two weeks with them if you keep them refrigerated and then they start to decline and shrivel up. I have some in my um, refrigerator, brown turkey, that uh, I let shrivel up into what I call little mummies in the refrigerator, but they're still just as sweet. They taste wonderful. 
There's one, uh, another one that I, I'll introduce you in a bit that I plucked off of the, uh, out of the orchard. Uh, and this one's a unique one. It, this is not, this pales in comparison to the actual color of the, uh, of the fruit on the tree. This one is, was referred to as my steak or mistake, my steak, mistake. Actually, it uh, came from Jay Nagel. He's passed on, he's a physicist that found this uh, right around uh, Magnolia, Texas. And um, it's a green fig. This one fell on the ground. And I want to, I'll tell you a little bit about these, you know. So it fell on the ground. Uh, it started um, decaying a little bit, started weeping. So I'm not sure it's even good on the inside anymore. So these, these guys are, fair, are really um, highly perishable. And I think that's why they're sought after so much. So a little bit about the botany. You didn't know this was going to be a botany lesson, I'll bet. A little bit about the botany of these plants. This um, is, ficus is, so there's two names of a scientific name, right? First name is genera or genus. Second name is a species. And they all come from a family. These plants, these trees come from the, from the family Moraceae, which includes mulberries and ficus. Now there's a reason why I'm telling you this. Members from this family will produce a latex from their stems. How many of you have uh, tried to pull an unripe fig off of a tree or even tried to harvest, you know, tried to uh, prune or cut those trees? You might see a little bit of a milky latex that comes off of it. If you can't imagine that, uh, think of uh, poinsettia. Poinsettia is not in the same plant family, but it does produce a milky sap that's slightly toxic. So these are organic uh, it's an organic um, material that's slightly caustic that comes off of these trees. What does that have to do with anything? What that means is when you're harvesting these fruits, here I'll show you a better one. When you're harvesting these fruits off of the tree themselves, you have to get them when they're all, almost ripe, when they're just ready to go. If they're green, they're not going to ripen on your countertop. I'll repeat that. If they're green and they're not ripe on the tree, they're not going to further ripen on your countertop. Now, I, this one, this uh, particular one, I did, it's a brown turkey. I did uh, find it beneath the tree this morning. It, it was on the tree yesterday. It just fell off overnight. Um, it uh, will continue to ripen a little bit because it's already initiated that process. But if it was pure green, it's not going to ripen more on your, on your countertop. So that's another reason why we treasure these particular fruits because they're very seasonal okay so when you're taking these off of the tree sometimes if you look at the what's called a peduncle or the little stalk that connects the fruit to the stem if you sometimes you'll remove that and you'll see a little milky sap on the end of that you can let that bleed out a little bit you know if you think it's going to ripen a little bit more the fruit ripen a little bit more let it bleed out a little bit it also means you need to take care when you're harvesting on moss right if you're harvesting a lot of that fruit uh, in in commercial production orchards in southern california or around the globe figs have been harvested the same through millennia these are hand harvested because they're very tender they bruise easily so fig, uh, figs are hand harvested. And what that means is that these, these people that are out in the, uh, the harvesters, the, the staff that are out there harvesting, wear long gloves, long sleeves. They wear gloves, protection, sometimes eyewear, right? Because they're gonna be exposed to that latex. You, if you, you, trust me, if you try to, uh, try to collect a whole bunch of these at one time, you're gonna start winding up with a little bit of latex. So I'm encouraging you folks to go ahead and put on some protection, put on some gloves prior to harvesting figs, just in case. Also, the leaves have uh, coarse, um, uh, short bristles on the underside of the leaf as well. So if you're passing by that tree and you're pruning, pruning it, not only will you might you get latex on your skin, but you also are gonna get an abrasion from the leaves themselves. So there's a reason why these are so special to us all. All right, so Moraceae is the family that these figs come from. There's over 2,000, so these are a ficus. The genera name is ficus. There's over 2,000 genus, no, excuse me, there's over 2,000 species of the genus ficus globally. Ficus carica is the edible one and that's what we eat. We eat the fruit from ficus carica. Now, let's get a little bit more complicated, folks. There are four forms or types 
of fig, of edible fig, or four, four, four types that we look at. And typically the one that we'll work with here successfully either in the humid south, Texas, or in other parts of Texas is, is considered to be the common fig. So if you hear somebody saying, oh, that's a common fig, it's not just a colloquialism they're using, right? It's not just a name they're saying, that's a common fig. It's, it's actually a, a verified form called the common fig. And those typically will have what we, ca what we call a closed eye. So I want you to look at this. I don't know if you can, here, I'll try to bring this up to the camera, see if you can see that. This one has somewhat of an open eye, brown turkey does. Some of you might call it the belly button. Technically, that there's a term for that. It's called the osteole. All right, let me show you some fancy words here. Well, let's start. So they'll have it. So we'll te typically, we'll work with the common fig. There are three other types. One is called the capra fig. That's producing only male flowers inside of the fruit. There's the Smyrna fig, which is all female, and it's only pollinated through um, the cap through the pollen from the capra fig and that's encouraged by a, a tiny little wasp we call the fig wasp that crawls in through that little eye the osteole and and provides that service then there's the smyrna fig to make it a little bit more complicated excuse me the san pedro fig i've talked about the capra fig and the smyrna the san pedro fig is parthenocarpic That means that what we're eating is actually a fruit without fertilization. Pretty cool. And this is a picture of the inside of my steak that I talked about a little bit earlier. Gorgeous color on the inside, a green fig on the outside, has a wonderful mild taste to it, and a large fig as well. So par Parthenocarpic is a fruit structure that's de that de develops without fertilization, which is pretty cool. The common fig does that. These others, They'll produce a fruit-like structure, but you know they they are uh, they do need a fertilization regime. So, what we're eating is called a siconium, or siconium if you're from South Texas. Siconium. It's an enlarged, fleshy, hollow receptacle with multiple ovaries or many, many different flowering structures, and it's. There's a gelatinous mass that forms around that. So think about that when you're eating a fresh or a dried fig next time. You're actually eating reproductive organs. I know that sounds weird, but you know, you're eating apples, it's the same thing. <laughs> so anyway, a little, uh, little fun with botany. So we're, we're eating uh, a uh, actually stem tissue that grows around, the stem tissue that grows around the reproductive organs, the flowers, infertile flowers, okay? Now you remember me telling you about the uh, osteole. There's the flowers, right? And the osteole is the eye. Now the osteole, that's where the little fig wasp runs, uh, crawls into there to uh, pollinate, continue that pollination regime for, for um, capra fig to the Smyrna and then for the San Pedro. San Pedro is interesting because it forms a, a fruit on mature wood. It's parthenocarpic. Right, so it forms a, a fruit without fertilization, and then uh, on the new wood, it needs that that um, that its female flowers on the inside, and still needs that capra fig pollen from the capra fig to uh, be introduced to it. So, um, yep, you're eating you're eating flowering part, you're eating fruiting parts, you're actually eating uh, uh, those uh, those fruits that are made out of stem tissue. Now. Let's get, let's get off of that for the moment. I know you probably have some questions. Our horticulture colleagues are helping to answer some of them as we're going through. I'm gonna to try to uh, talk a little bit about maintenance and spacing of these trees when you put them out. Fig trees can get really large. If you have a fig, fig tree or if you know somebody that has a fig tree, oftentimes when we're, I'm going to discourage you from doing this, letting the trees go. Don't let the trees go. These trees have the capacity to reach 20 feet tall by 30 feet wide. They'll get really big. There are some that are smaller. I'll, if I have time, I'll introduce you to some plants, a list, put a list of plants that are container appropriate. But right now, we put all of these in the ground. When you put them in the ground, you gotta put them in full sun. Think about these thing, the following things when you're thinking about introducing a tree, either in your yard or developing an orchard. You gotta consider soil. 
are, are what is what are the soil new are there soil nutrients what soil nutrients are available to that plant prior to putting it in so always get a soil test capture water get a water test from whatever, whatever water source you have send it off to a lab there's a lab at college station that's staffed by colleagues from texas a&m agrilife extension the soil water and and uh, forage lab doesn't cost much to send in a test of either the wa a water sample or a soil sample, but it'll give you a great foundation to know where to start from there so that you can be successful, okay? So consider soil, consider that these trees are shallow rooted with fibrous roots, which means that they uh, can, if, if we have a, a period of drought, certainly they'll suffer from that. It also means that, that they can be affected during a hard freeze as well. So oftentimes we'll compensate for that by planting them just slightly deeper than we are told to do for an ornamental tree. So for fig trees, we make the exception, we plant them just maybe a couple of inches deeper than we normally would to provide a little bit of protection. Also, you're going to want to make sure that not only that the water quality is good for these trees, figs are more forgiving as far as fruit trees go. They can handle, you know, not, not stellar quality water, but certainly we don't want to give them brackish water, right? But certainly they can, they can handle a, a, um, a different differential in quality of water. So they're not as finicky that way. But we want to make sure that we can get quantity of water to them. We want to make sure that we can get adequate water to them. So never forget that. Any plant that you're putting out, make sure that you can get water easily to that. When we're watering our fig trees, always make sure it's drip irrigation or some sort of bottom, bottom watering. And the, and the reason for that, there's one particular pathogen called fig rust. If you don't know about fig rust or if you don't have it, eventually you will at some point. The way to control that is to monitor your plants, always clean the orchard floor, what we call the orchard floor, discard affected leaves if it's applicable for you. Um, we do have a tree out here that got hit so bad by fig rust, it, the, the tree itself has no more leaves on it. It's a Celeste that we have. I need to rehabilitate it anyway, but, but we let that tree get to a, a, an optimum size. It's pretty big. So again, when you're considering putting these plants in the ground, consider those factors. Fertilization, we do have some information, a uh, fact sheet on Aggie horticulture, the, uh, our, our, web, our web page for our organization under the fruit and nuts section. There's a fact sheet on figs and the recommendation is for frequent application of nitrogen or products containing nitrogen. So bag of fertilizer, you have three, three uh, primary numbers on it. First number is nitrogen, second number is phosphorus, and the third number is potassium. We're gonna to want to go with a fertilizer product. I'm offering to you to use a fertilizer with, with a ratio of three, one, two. 3% 3 nitrogen, 1% phosphorus, and 2% potassium. But always, always let your soil test be your guide to help you understand what needs to go out in that orchard or underneath that tree. So when you're watering, make sure you get adequate water to it. Pay attention during the summertime. Of course, this is just, this is uh, almost like speaking to the choir. We know these things, but we need to practice these things as well. Because these plants are shallow rooted, they can dry out really quickly and it will affect their production. All right, folks. I've talked a little bit about fruiting. I've just kind of glossed over fertilization. Water in the middle of summer right now, we're expecting some rain, so I'll lay off the watering in the orchard, but I wanna get at least a, a one inch out there per week, you know, when there's no water. I wanna make sure I'm getting good penetration. Because these guys are sh uh, shallow rooting and uh, fibrous roots, we wanna lift them up. We don't want those, these plants, to these trees to sit in water. Another reason to take a soil test, you wanna know how well your soil is draining. Do, commit to a simple percolation test, which means digging a hole about three feet deep, filling it water with water, and measuring how that water drains over a 24-hour period. Do a simple perk test, it's easy to do. All right, let's see. I think I've covered most of those basics. I do want to uh, talk about spacing. For spacing the trees, if you're building a small orchard or putting trees together, again, fig trees need full sun to do their best. They, they just do. You can put them in the shade, shade of a tree. I had 
uh, a client uh, email me and say, my, my fig is not producing fruit, what's going on? Well, it was in full shade. It did produce some fruit for her, but it wasn't consistent. So these trees do need well-draining soil, but they need to be in full sun. If you're going to put them next to another tree or like a shed outside in your backyard or, or some other place, don't put them up next to the house, certainly. Don't do that. But if you're putting them in between, in between trees in a row, Get them at least 15 feet apart, maybe 20 feet apart at max. Why do we do that? Once we walk out to the orchard, I'll demonstrate why we do that. It's, to, it's mostly for maintenance, to get around the trees, to get into the trees. Uh, a lot of times when we're working in orchards, we've got these trees spaced at least 20 feet apart on rows, right? 20 feet uh, in, the, in the row itself that you're, not in the row, but in between the row. So we can get, um, we can get uh, equipment down that, we can get tractors or, or vehicles down that, but also 15 to 20 feet apart on a row because these trees have the capacity to get large. And I don't know about you, but I've often made that mistake as well, just not getting to that tree and pruning it out. Now these trees will be, are, they will be a multi-trunk tree. When you put it in the ground, you know, the suggestion for getting a new tree, if you have a cutting from a friend or you get buy it from the store oftentimes we'll say to head that back by about a half you know half of half of that so it looks like sticks uh, when you plant these trees you want to make sure to get them in in late winter always pay attention to where you are and what your last uh, your last anticipated freeze date is so these are things that we always have to keep in mind they they sound like common sense but oftentimes you'll forget that when you get excited and you're like ah i want i want some of these wonderful fruits well, you gotta, you gotta work for that, and you gotta make sure all the conditions are right for that tree to grow. Now, these trees will produce fruit off of new wood, what we call this year's growth. The trees that we'll look at, I put them out in the, our orchard late last year, late last winter in 2019. And they, they hung around as short little sticks for a while, you know, all summer long. Some did produce a few fruits like my steak did, and. Uh, uh, I think LSU Purple uh, put out a couple of fruits, but I made sure to um, that it wasn't really that it wasn't focusing so much on that production. I wanted it to establish its roots. So put it in late winter. Make sure that you're watching out for those freeze events. You know, just kind of judge that, and then just move forward uh, with it. Um, the second year's growth is when you're really going to start getting production, and that's what we'll see when we go out to my orchard. Um, we'll see pro we'll see some fig trees like LSU purple has a closed eye on it remember these are common figs some of them will have a slightly open eye this is a uh, one that I, I got lucky and it produced a fig about a week ago and this coloration is just beautiful on this fig it's a teardrop shape of course the picture is bigger than the fig itself figs may be about you know about uh, one and a half two inches wide teardrop shaped about two and a half inches tall if you will but they're just gorgeous and they seem to shine you know they have this wonderful gradation of purplish whitish color to it this is what the inside of LSU purple looks like and it's got a it's a mild flavored fig but I really really like this for its color and its texture so it's not a very um, not very sweet it's more of a mild fig that may be your preference We'll see a tree on another one called Italian Black. These are rounded fruits. They have almost a uh, dark, dark red, black fruit to it, kind of oval shaped. Very similar to LSU Purple in its coloration on the inside, but shiny black fruit. These are great for preserves and they produce a larger fruit and they're very, very sweet. So not as mild as LSU Purple, but uh, they're glorious in, pre in preserves. One that we don't have out here, and I want to look forward to getting, and this is a bad picture, horrible picture, but I gotta show it to you anyway. It's one called Blue Giant. And Blue Giant produces a fruit that's kind of pinkish on the outside, and the fruit uh, is known to get up to be the palm size. Very large fruit. And according to the information that I've read, it should do well here on the Gulf Coast. So when you're looking at varieties, always connect with your ag local ag office, your ag extension office. We want to pro keep providing this quality information to you and direct you to those sources or those plants where you'll be successful with them. 
fig trees are not cold tolerant as it goes. So there are some varieties like Celeste, which is cold tolerant. There's another a variety that we'll look at out in the orchard called Alma, A-L-M-A, -A, Alma. That's not cold tolerant. It's very frost sensitive. So you want to watch out for that. You want to be aware of that. Another thing that I'll talk to you about is size of these trees. And let's go out to the orchard. I think it's about time to do that. I'm going to remove you from this pedestal. And we're going to take a walk out to the orchard. It's a short walk. And I think I can walk and talk at the same time. I've been known to do that. Um, there's others that we can work with, of course. There's stand, standards like a brown turkey. There is one interesting one that's a light-colored fig, and it's called lemon. And it, supposedly it has citrus overtones to it, so uh, I have yet to try that. Now, we do have, we do have partners in the uh, county as well. Uh, Mr. Froberg from Froberg's Farms, he's uh, allowing us to uh, trial out some figs put some figs on his property. Those figs were cuttings from the um, Viticulture Institute, a research station out in Fredericksburg that uh, Jim Camus, fruit specialist out in Fredericksburg, is managing those orchards in that facility. Um, shout out to Jim. But yeah, uh, we've been uh, working with that. Um, one of our horticulturists, Stephen Yanok, is, is, is uh, working with Mr. Fro Froberg out there, so we're really excited to see some of these, uh, trial them out, see how well they do down here in the Gulf Coast. I'm going to try to turn this around really quickly. See if I can do this. Ta-da! All right. This is LSU Purple. Now, for these particular trees, you remember I was saying that you have to space them about 15 to 20 feet apart in a row and that's important it may look like it's a lot of space but trust me if these trees get out of hand there's just no way i could get around them in a mower uh, or to fertilize them it just makes it much more difficult so we want to make sure that these trees are spaced adequately apart because as you can see they're already starting to gain some stature now figs look alike it's just the nature of the beast. The difference is going to be in fruiting as well as leaf shape. So this is LSU purple. I've got these two PVC posts because I'm thinking about covering this when it produces fruit. You know why we cover this, right folks? We cover these trees because we want to eat the fruit because we're a selfish species and so are the birds and so are the squirrels. How do you keep birds and squirrels off of the fruit? Well, by netting or you cover those individual fruits or you let the tree get big enough and you just share with, with nature. So LSU Purple is already starting to produce some uh, fruit up along the stem. These trees want to grow in a large shrub shape and oftentimes they're multi-trunk. So this is a second year growth on this. And this tree is probably, I would guess, it's about at least a good three to four feet tall. It's already starting to grow and you can see that it's producing fruit on new wood. There are some varieties like uh, a variety called Celeste, which has what we call a Breba crop. Breba is spelled B-R-E. B A. That means it produces two crops a year. Has the potential to do that. This one that we're looking at, this is Italian black. And it's just full of fruit. Now they're not quite ready yet. Italian black has the potential to, to produce a Breba crop. Oftentimes uh, the Breba crop won't be as robust as the uh, the full crop. For this one, I missed the pruning on it, so I'm going to keep it pruned up in it in a shrub-like shape. Just keep it in a natural form, but I will go in and start uh, pruning some of those branches back so I can get some airflow through that tree. Behold Alma! I love Alma because I just love that growth. It's not as lanky or leggy as, as Italian black, but it's just full of fruit right now. It's the same as Italian black in that it's producing a lot of fruit. Now I do have a little bit of scale on the tree, but um, I'll be trying to hit that with some horticultural oil later in the season. So how do you tell these trees apart? Again, we have to look at the leaf shape 
Sometimes you look at the margins of the leaf itself. All of these leaves are palmate shaped. In other words, they're the shape of your hand. And they have these wonderful deep sinuses or lobes in them. And some are more characteristic than others. But the difference, there's very subtle differences between Alma and Italian black as far as the leaf shape goes. Where we really can tell sometimes it's the growth habit, but certainly once it produces fruit. We're going to skirt on past this pear tree here. And I'm going to show you my little treasure. This is the Nagel fig. It doesn't look like much, but I love the tree form that it's taking. We did prune it to get it to grow more upright. We're going to continue to train it this way. So as far as training figs, it's to your aesthetic and what, how you like to, to harvest. Right? Now, how do you know when a fig is ripe? You know when a fig is ripe when by touch, this one, I can, it's got a, a lighter green color, which is its color at ripeness. They'll kind of droop a little bit. You can kind of see that this green fig that I have my hand on, it's a little bit more stiff. It's more erect or upright. This one that appears riper to me, riper, is that a word? More ripe is drooping just a little bit. And what you, and you know, if it produces enough fruit, you basically just pluck it off to see if it's really ready to go. Now you can see that this one's bleeding that latex a little bit. So that means it may not be fully ripe, but it's almost there. And um, if we have time, I'll cut into this in a little bit. But I've got another one that's coming on. And they're just fabulous. It's a fabulous um, milder fig. So again, your aesthetic dictates what, how you're going to form these, these trees. Either let it take a multi-trunk shape, a shrub shape, or tree form it. I'm thinking tree forming is probably better because you can get up underneath that tree. You can fertilize it adequately, put down fertilize, you can water it more, uh, you can keep an eye on it better. Um, yeah, it's, it's all up to you folks. Now we had another fig tree that I thought we had two Celeste fig trees and so we cut this one down and then I came back and found the tag on it which is important, always tag your trees because you're going to forget what you got, right? This one we're thinking is a mission fig. It has a completely different um, leaf structure on it. And it came back just this year, so we're hoping that it will produce fruit for us next year. So the beauty of some of these trees, uh, fig trees in general, if you do head them back, if you decide to rehabilitate them, you often can cut them back pretty hard. But remember, that depends on cutting it back. Uh, pruning these plants really depends on its type. Does it provide, is it a, does it produce a breba crop or a spring crop? And when we say spring crop, we mean uh, producing fruit in May or early June. This is brown turkey. Brown turkey is almost there. It's almost there, folks. It's got a nice little tight osteole. Uh, there it's got a nice little red but belly button or eye the fruits themselves are getting fairly large now they're starting to swell and some of them are actually starting to turn a little bit of colors this is another one that fell off the tree today so it's already starting to blush this one fell off a little prematurely I think it's still green but um, we did cut this tree back pretty hard and it's responding and has produced fruit for us this year. We did not get a Breba crop off of this one, but it's, it's outstanding in what it's producing for us now. And this tree is probably about, I'm six foot four, so I'm trying to judge it. It's probably about four and a half feet tall right now and uh, at least six feet wide. That to me is the perfect size for a home fig tree. Keep them cut a little bit low so that you can reach them and you can protect them. Protection can be from a screen or a scrim. You can take that extra step and do that. Remember I said that Alma is a frost sensitive fig. So certainly we're going to be covering Alma this year and we're going to keep an eye on the, uh, we're going to keep an eye on the, on the temperatures. So folks, I'm, I'm having a really good time out here. It's, where it's a blessing and a curse to have these fronts coming through. 
there's Alma again. I'm gonna come out later and actually pick some fruits because I think I'm getting a little hungry. And here we are, Alma, that was my steak, sorry. This one's Alma, Italian black, and LSU purple. Well, folks, my alarm just went off. I wanna thank you all for joining me today on this adventure in figs, talking a little bit about fabulous figs. I think I'm gonna go ahead and walk you over into the shade for a moment. And if you'll hang on with me just a couple more seconds, I'm trying to turn my camera around. Oh, um, folks, unfortunately, I ran out of time, so I didn't have time to show you any fig rust. We did have some on the brown turkey, but I'm already heading back to the uh, car and I'm trying to get my camera to turn around, but I'm having horrible luck doing this. Oh, well. Well, we'll wind up this program. I'll t we'll provide a list. The video itself will be available to you later on to, re to review. We'll also have a list of trees appropriate for our area, for your area to consider. Also, container plants. Unfortunately, I am recording this. Uh, I printed out, okay, let's see if it works. Ah, it works. All right, folks, I'm gonna show you a list really quickly of plants that you can work with, consider for containers. Let's see if I've got it. Yep, there it is. For containers, consider these particular fig trees. Green Ischia. Yes, there is one called Little Miss Figgy. I've got one called Little Ruby, which is on my porch right now. I'm in a townhouse and I have limited space. And Little Ruby is considered to be a true dwarf. It only gets four by four, four foot by four foot. So I'm really interested in that one. Hasn't produced this year. I just purchased it last year. Another one called Petite Negri. And then finally, my hand's getting in the way. Violette de Bordeaux. Sorry about that, folks. So thank you very much for joining me today. I'm so glad I could share uh, my, our orchard with you. Again, this is Stephen Bruggerhoff with Brazoria County AgriLife Extension, part of the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Horticulture Team, bringing quality programs to you to help to improve your skills and improve your life. I also want to give a shout out to our team of horticulturists that have been helping to answer your questions today. I hope it's been very useful for you. This is part of a larger initiative. We have a larger initiative called the Path to Plate Program. Path to Plate encompasses all the best of what we do. Ag and natural resources. We're trying to help improve lives, people's lives through nutrition-based programs, through horticulture programs like this. Did you know the figs are highly nutritious? They're high in fiber, high in calcium. Half a cup of dried figs is equivalent to a half a cup of milk. I can't say enough good things about figs. Folks, thank you very much for joining us today. We'll see you next week.